Welcome to Pavenars, webinars for the pavement community. We'll be talking about Stone Matrix Asphalt, or SMA, and please note that this is an update to an older Pavenar, and this update is being recorded in 2020. So the original SMA Pavenar was held and recorded on December 4th, 2012, and it was requested by the New Mexico Department of Transportation. It was posted on YouTube September 10th, 2018, and the link is provided there. And I'm happy to say there have been over 1,000 views. And at that point, I thought, well, it's time for an update. The original Pavenar is about eight years old now, so it'd be nice to get an updated Pavenar with newer resources available and any sort of updates on the content as well. And before we proceed, SMA has also been called stone mastic asphalt. So as you look through literature, you can see the term stone matrix asphalt and stone mastic asphalt. Both of those stand for SMA. We will be using the term stone matrix asphalt. So what we'll talk about today, we'll start with the background, which is an overview and a history of SMA. We'll then go into the design of SMA, which includes materials and mixture proportioning, critical properties, and we'll go over a brief innovative mixed design approach, and that is new since 2012. We'll talk about the production and construction of SMA, which includes the materials and the equipment and the laydown and the compaction. And then we'll go over some recent developments. There was a international conference on SMA in 2018, a very nice document put out by NCAT on the performance and life cycle cost of SMA, also in 2018. And then coincidentally, in 2018, there was also a very nice document put out by the European Asphalt Pavement Association, or EAPA, uh, about SMA in Europe. So let's start out with what is SMA. SMA is made of aggregate and asphalt binder. The use of a stabilizing additive is optional. And when you look at it through the lens of traditional super paved mix design, it's considered a gap graded mix. And because it's a gap graded, gap graded mix, it's heavily reliant on the large stone to stone contact. So these large stones are forming the skeleton of your SMA mixture. SMA is often used as a surface course, so just the very top of the pavement structure. It's designed to be durable and resistant to deformation on that surface course. And in order to do this, you want to use hard cubicle coarse aggregate, and that aggregate provides the stone on stone contact and that aggregate forms the skeleton of the SMA. Now these large, hard, cubical coarse aggregates are held together by mortar. And mortar is asphalt binder plus filler, which is P200 material or the dust material in your mixture. And some sort of stabilizing additive is generally used. And the asphalt binder is usually polymer modified. Some of the advantages that have been found for using SMA is it has a high resistance to rutting. You get improved low temperature performance, so against low temperature cracking. You have improved macro texture, which reduces the tire noise and also helps with skid resistance. And you have some ease of compaction with static rollers. Now looking at SMA through a pictorial lens, this is from the very nice website pavementinteractive.org. You can see here pictorially SMA has the coarse aggregate which provides the skeleton and the stone on stone contact and this is what reduces the rutting potential. You then have the mortar which in this pictorial is called inactive particles and these are the smaller aggregate that are not part of the skeleton. And as a part of this mortar, we have the asphalt binder, which again is generally polymer modified, and it's usually greater than 6%, so it's a pretty high level of asphalt binder loading. You have your P200 material or your dust material, and you have your stabilizing additive. And volumetrically, the results are you have a high VMA, 
which is greater than 17%, and you have a low air voids. I apologize, we have a mistake there, but your air voids are approximately 4%. Now, what is the history of SMA? It was developed in Germany in the 1960s, and it was developed to resist studded tire wear. In the 1970s, it was used pretty extensively throughout all of Europe. And then in the 1980s, it came over to North America, and it was used on several projects in both Canada, and it was introduced in the United States. In the 1990s, the use in the United States continued to increase after a scanning tour of Europe. So a group of professionals went over to Europe to examine SMA work, and when they came back, they started implementing it here in the United States. Then in 2002, there was an SMA workshop in Maryland in the United States. And then in 2018, we had the first international conference on SMA in Atlanta, Georgia. Here are some numbers on the use of SMA in both Europe and the United States. So in Europe, this chart on the right is the percent of total hot mix or warm mix asphalt production. What percent of that is SMA? And you can see there's quite a large range. There's a range of 1.2% to 14.2%. And that 1.2% use of SMA is in Spain, the second to last on the table. And the 14.2% is the second country, Belgium. So quite a large range um, with a, a pretty decent distribution in there. Some of the, the countries, though, are around that uh, 7 to 10% to usage. Now, in the United States, the numbers aren't quite as clear, but we do have some numbers from between 2011 and 2015. This is when NCAP performed a survey and 13 states responded. And they responded as how much SMA do they use as a percentage of polymer modified super paved mixtures. So you can see in Europe, that number is the percentage of total hot mix asphalt and warm mix asphalt. But in the US, their numbers were reported just as a percentage of polymer modified super paved mixtures. And the range was 4.2% were SMA all the way up to 66.7. And in average, it was 26.2% of the 30.9 million tons of mix. So just under 10 million tons of SMA was placed uh, between 2011 and 2015 in the United States. Here are some current SMA specifications that are being used both in Europe and the United States. In Europe, you have EN 13108-5, and this is called Bituminous Mixtures Material Specifications for Stone Mastic Asphalt. Here in the United States, we have AASHTO M325, which is a standard specification for stone matrix asphalt, and AASHTO R45, R46, which is the standard practice for designing stone matrix asphalt, or SMA. Now, all of these are behind paywalls, but if you're interested in seeing a free SMA specification, go ahead and take a look at TxDOT's specification, and their item 346 is for stone matrix asphalt, and you can find this by simply Googling SMA TxDOT 346, and you can download the specification online free of charge. So that provides a little bit of background of SMA, and now we're gonna move on to the design of SMA. Again, when we're thinking about the design of SMA, we need to find out our base material properties. This includes the aggregate properties, the mineral filler, or the P200, the asphalt binder, and any sort of stabilizing additives. We need to determine what the proper design gradation is and what sort of volumetric properties we're looking for. And during this section of the presentation, we're going to be following AASHTO M325 and R46 in order to go through these different components of the properties and the design of SMA. Taking a look first at the aggregate properties, these are all from AASHTO M325. You can see we have our coarse aggregate, we have our LA abrasion and flat and elongated particles. And you can see we have the AASHTO limits on the right side of the column. So our LA abrasion is a 30% maximum loss. And then our flat and elongated particles for a 3 to 1 ratio is 20% maximum. And a 5 to 1 ratio is 5% maximum. We also have some 
requirements for water absorption, soundness, and crushed content. So for the water absorption, you can absorb a maximum of 2% water for your coarse aggregate. For the soundless loss, it's run on either sodium, sulf sodium sulfate or magnesium sulfate. And after five cycles, you either have a 15 or 20% loss, depending on whether you use the sodium sulfate or magnesium sulfate. And then for the crush content, one face is 100% and two faces is 90% for your coarse aggregate. Shifting over to your fine aggregate, your soundless loss, again, for both sodium and magnesium sulfate is 15 to 20%, depending on which chemical you use. Your liquid limit for the fine aggregate is 25, and you want a non-plastic plasticity index. And again, these are all from AASHTO M325. Now, thinking specifically about just the mineral filler, your mineral filler can be either crushed fines, which is on the left-hand picture, or fly ash, which is on the right-hand picture. Your plasticity index of the mineral filler itself should not be greater than 4%, and you should have no organic impurities in the mineral filler. And then also, we have the Rigdon voids requirement for the min mineral filler. And the modified Rigdon voids should not be greater than 50%. And the Rigdon voids are the void volume in a dry compacted mineral filler. And why this is important is it's used to estimate the stiffening effect of fines when they're mixed with asphalt cement. So when you mix mineral filler or P200 with asphalt cement, you get a very, very stiff asphalt cement where the mineral filler is literally floating in the asphalt cement. And, it's, and that floating mineral filler creates a stiffening effect. So we want to make sure that we do not have too much mineral filler, which will increase the stiffness to a point where it's detrimental to the mix. And that's done by that modified Rigdon voids requirement. Moving on now, we covered the aggregate, the mineral filler, and now the asphalt binder. We generally in the United States use PG binder grades and they must meet the requirements of AASHTO M320. And as I mentioned before, they are generally polymer modified. And now looking at the stabilizing additives, which are optional, you can use either cellulose or mineral fiber and you use 0.3% by total mixture mass for the cellulose or 0.4% for the mineral fibers. And you may be asking why are there different numbers for the cellulose or their mineral fiber? That's because the mineral fibers add surface area. However, they do not absorb the binder. Therefore, you need a little higher dosage rate in order to coat those surfaces, but not have any additional absorption. And w these stabilizing additives are used to combat drain down. And the drain down requirements are a maximum of 0.3% of the asphalt binder after one hour. So essentially what you do is you compact a sample you put it in a pan for one hour and you see how much material drains out of that sample and you want a maximum of 0.3% at one hour. Now that we've talked about the different components, we need to design the gradation for our SMA. And you can see here, these are all in percent passing. We first are gonna see the German and the FHWA you can see that there is a large gap between the 4.75 sieve, or the number 4 sieve, and the 9.5 millimeter sieve, or the 3 8 inch sieve. So that is where that gap gradation comes in. So you have a lot of very coarse particles, a large jump down, and then you have a high amount of fines, which is that number 200 as well. And What's interesting to this as well is you can see there's actually a number 635 sieve as well in the FHWA requirements. And this is interesting because a lot of times in our industry, we simply say P200. Anything smaller than a number 200 sieve is the same. However, there has been research that showed even the gradation smaller than a number 200 can really heavily influence the stiffening effect of the asphalt binder. So going back to that Rignan voids test that we need to run to make sure that we don't stiffen the asphalt binder too much with our P200, the gradation below the P200 can play a role, and that's why the FHWA has that number 635 sieve in there, which is very unusual to see in asphalt concrete.
And you can see here, very similar gradations. Now there's small differences on some of the saves, but NCHRP, AASHTO, and the Unified Facilities work also all saw that big gap between the number four and the 3.8 sieve, where all of that, um, that delineation between a, a coarse aggregate and then the fine aggregates on the other end. And this is just an example of a 12.5 millimeter nominal maximum aggregate size. And if we take a look at AASHTO M325, they obviously have in that fourth column a gradation for 12.5 millimeters, but they also have a 19 millimeter and a 9.5 millimeter nominal maximum aggregate size gradation in the specification. Now transitioning over to volumetric properties, again our air voids, which is properly labeled here in percent, AASHTO M325 is targeting 4% air voids. Our VMA, we want 17% minimum VMA. And then we also have this VCA for both a mix and a DRC. And we're going to talk about the mix and the DRC in the upcoming slides. But once you have your mix, you need to do the tensile strength ratio, which is 0.8 minimum, the drain down at production temperature, which is 0.3% maximum, and then the asphalt binder content, which is a minimum of 6%. And there are special considerations for the air voids, for the VCA of the mix, and for the binder content. So again, we're going to hone in a little more on those specific properties, especially that VCA mix, because that's not something that we typically see in asphalt concrete mix design. So when we're thinking about these special considerations, the air voids, they can be a little lower on either low volume roads or in cold climates. So if you're in those situations, you can actually have a little lower three to 4% air voids. And also you can have lower asphalt binder contents if your aggregate specific gravities are greater than 2.75. So if you have high specific gravities on your aggregates, you can also lower the asphalt binder content a little bit. And there's details within the specifications going into that. Now the VCA, the voids in coarse aggregate is a little more complicated. And this makes a lot of sense because remember, SMA is highly dependent on that stone on stone contact of the coarse aggregate. So it makes sense that we spend a little extra time thinking about the VCA or the voids in the coarse aggregate. So the voids in the coarse aggregate or the VCA is again, based on this fact that the SMA must have the coarse aggregate skeleton with stone on stone content. And when we talk about SMA, we talk about R4. So what is retained on the R4 sieve for half inch or three quarter inch nominal maximum aggregate size SMAs. And then it's an R8 for that three eighths inch nominal maximum aggregate size SMA. So coarse aggregate is either what's retained on the four sieve or retained on the eight sieve, depending on your nominal maximum aggregate size. And we take a look at this stone on stone content for the voids and coarse aggregate or the VCA of the compacted mix, which is the VCA mix. And then the second one that we saw is the VCA of the dry rotted te test or the DRC. And what we wanna ensure is that the VCA of the compacted mix is less than the VCA of the dry rotted mix. And if our VCA of the compacted mix is less than the VCA of the dry rotted test, we have stone on stone content, contact. So what is this VCA mix and VCA DRC and how can we quantify those in order to ensure we have the stone on stone contact? Well, here's the calculation for the VCA mix. So we have the VCA mix, the VCA of the mix is calculated by taking 100 and subtracting the GMB, and the GMB is the bulk specific gravity of the compacted mixture, divided by the GCA, which is the bulk specific gravity of the coarse aggregate, and those two terms are multiplied by the PCA, which is the percent of coarse aggregate in the total mixture. So by taking those bulk specific gravities and the percent of coarse aggregate in the total mixture, Subtracting it from 100, we're able to calculate the VCA of the mix. Now, conversely, we're taking a look at the dry rotted VCA. The calculation is a little more complicated, but again, the GCA is the bulk specific gravity of 
the course aggregate and then you can see the gamma sub s is the unit weight of the coarse aggregate fraction in the dry rotted condition and the gamma sub w is the unit weight of the water. So you take those terms, you multiply them by 100. And for the SMA, it is required that the VCA of the mix is less than the VCA of the dry rotted condition, or DRC. Now this is just a very brief overview of this concept. More details can be found in Ashto R46, but this gives you a flavor of the importance and the concept of the voids and coarse aggregate, and specifically the voids and the coarse aggregate when we're looking at the mix and when we're looking at the dry rotted condition. Now that is the mix design according to Ashto R46, but there has been an innovative mix design approach that's been presented, and this is a 10-step approach. And it revolves around what the authors called a virtual compacted SMA with optimized stone on stone. And this is represented by a capital V sub V dot SS. And this virtually compacted SMA with optimized stone on stone is dependent on six volumes. That includes the total volume, the fine aggregate volume, the filler volume, the stabilizer volume, the binder volume, and the coarse aggregate. And you can see those volumes there on the right. And it's also dependent on the key properties. And these key properties include the bulk density of the compacted coarser aggregate, the void characteristics, and then the particle breakage in the field. So one of the things that this innovative mix design recommend recognizes is that a volumetric design is very appropriate and breaking it down into those six volumes provides a very accurate design methodology. It also recognizes however that because SMA is so highly dependent on the stone on stone contact if there is any particle breakage in the field that could potentially influence the performance of the SMA. So those are kind of the two big concepts that are highlighted in this innovative mix design approach. And if you're interested in learning more about this, you can look at RMPD, Road Materials and Pavement Design, and the title is A New SMA Mix Design Approach for Optimization of Stone-on-Stone -stone Effect. And it's from 2019, Volume 20, Supplement 1. Now, moving from the design to the production and construction of SMA, when we think about the production of SMA, we usually use fractionated aggregates, and that means that the aggregates are pre-sorted into specific sizes. And that is because precision control for gradation is absolutely critical to ensure good performance in the field. So by fractionating your aggregate in the production facility, that allows you to have a much more precise control of the aggregate. And often a single stockpile is used, and that's because you have so much coarse aggregate in your mixture. But what you can do is you can split it into two cold feed bins. Because you're using so much of that one stockpile, you can actually have two cold feed bins in your plant and that ensures that you won't run out of that one aggregate during production. And if necessary, you can use portable screening equipment in order to get more of that coarse aggregate gradation that's necessary for the good performance. On the other end of the size spectrum, the mineral filler addition, you can either add it in the mixing chamber or the cold feed bin in a drum plant. You can add it directly to a pug mill in a batch plant because you want to avoid the bag house sucking it out. So in many plant facilities, there is a, a vacuum in either the mixing chamber or cold feed bin in the drum plant or in the pug mill in a batch plant, there's a vacuum that's sucking out excessive fines that get suspended in the air. But because mineral filler is so small, it's such a small size, you may be sucking out some of the mineral filler that's required for the performance of the SMA. So you wanna make sure that you do not suck out too much of the mineral filler during your manufacturing process. And then also you want to make sure that you add this material dry. So you can't have it in a stockpile that's outside exposed to the elements because it could get wet. And you want it to be dry so it can flow and so it can get evenly mixed into the SMA mixture. Now for the cellulose fibers, it can be added in two ways. You can either add it directly to the pug mill by hand in a plastic bag. 
and you want to mix it dry for 6 to 10 seconds before adding the binder. Or you can add it through some sort of feed system, feeder system. And this allows for your feed rate to vary with the plant production. So if you're producing a little faster or a little slower, this allows you to have a little more control over the precise rate at which that cellulose fiber is added. Now transitioning to construction, you must have a material transfer vehicle when you are using SMA. And what a material transfer vehicle does, or an MTV, is it decreases segregation, and this can be both thermal segregation or the gradation of the aggregate itself, and it can also reduce the amount of crushing of the aggregate during construction. And what this does with the decrease of, of uh, aggregate segregation, thermal segregation, and crushing, what this does is you improve your in-place density uniformity. Now, one thing that is recommended is that your screed have a heavy tamping bar. And what this does is you have a higher degree of initial compaction directly behind the paver. And this increases the smoothness or improves the smoothness of your SMA mat. It also minimizes what is called your differential roll down. And the differential roll down is a thickness change between the paver and the final compaction. And this is very important because this stone on stone contact is so critical to SMA, you don't want to be hitting that SMA mat with too many roller passes because you'll start crushing your coarse aggregate. Now also because of the coarse nature of SMA, you do have a quicker loss of temperature than traditional SMA, therefore you have a shorter paving train. So pretty much all of the rest other than what's on this slide is the same between traditional asphalt concrete and SMA. So you want all the best practices, but you do want to also have a material transfer vehicle. You want to have a tamping bar on the screed, and also you want to minimize the length of your paving train. So you want the trucks to deliver it to the MTV, which places it in the paver. You want all that as short as possible, and then you want the rollers as close behind the paver as possible as well, because you don't want your mat to cool too quickly before it gets compacted. And then here's a picture of some tamping bars on the bottom of a screed. So you can see this provides some compaction immediately as it's getting placed through the paver, which again minimizes that differential between the height or the thickness of the pavement layer uh, between the screed and the final roller going over. Now for compaction, it is not recommended to use vibratory compaction because then that again increases the potential for crushing of coarse aggregate. It could also bring excess binder to the surface. So if you have vibratory compaction, compaction excess binder could be sucked up to the surface. You could fracture your aggregate. But if you do need vibratory compaction, one option would be to have the first pass as a static pass and then subsequent passes with very low amplitude, high frequency vibrating. But in general, we do not recommend using vibratory compaction. Now, some states in the United States require a 300 pounds per linear inch maximum for SMA. Again, this reduces the fracturing and that excess binder on the surface. And this can only be accomplished with narrow rollers. And if you have these narrow rollers, you are going to need more passes, which is a little difficult with the shorter paving train. And then finally, rubber tire rollers are not recommended because of the high chance of pickup on those tires. Because you have these coarse aggregates, single coarse aggregates could be pulled out of the mat while they stick to the pneumatic rider tire rollers, and that is not recommended. So for the final product, in-place density is absolutely critical. You want to have less than 6% air voids because once it's fully cooled, you're not going to get much additional compaction due to traffic. Your lift thicknesses are generally 1 to 2 inches, so it's relatively thin, and you want to have a thickness to nominal maximum aggregate size ratio of 4 to 1. That is the recommended ratio for best performance. Now you can see here on a freshly placed mat, there is quite a bit of asphalt binder in this mixture, so you can have some problems with early skid resistance, and that's because you have that relatively high film thickness on the coarse aggregate. So while it's still hot, if you do have skid resistant issues, you can add just a little bit of sand, and that absorbs the excess binder. 
but you don't want to add too much sand because then you can start reducing permeability and filling the voids. So it's just a very light sprinkling of sand and that helps a little bit with that early skid resistance if necessary. So we've gone over the background, the design, the production and construction. Now let's go over some recent developments of SMA. We're going to go over three reports just very briefly, but I highly encourage you if you're interested in learning more about SMA to search for these online because all of them are available online free for download. So the first report is the International Conference on SMA, and this is the first international conference. This is put on by the National Asphalt Pavement Association, or NAPA, and it's Special Report 223, and the title is Advances in the Design, Production, and construction of stone matrix asphalt. So if you Google NAPA Special Report 223, this should be one of the first PDFs that pop up. The second document is put out by the National Center for Asphalt Technology and it's titled The Performance and Life Cycle Cost of SMA. And this is Report 18-03. So again, if you Google NCAT Report 18-03, this report should pop up as one of the first PDFs. And then finally, uh, SMA in Europe was put out by the European Asphalt Pavement Association, and it is titled Heavy Duty Surfaces, the Arguments for SMA, and you can Google EAPA SMA 2018, and this should be one of the first PDFs that pop up. So let's just very briefly go over each one of these reports and what's inside them, so you can see if you're interested in learning more for them. So the NAPA Special Report 223, again, I recommend you just Google NAPA Special Report 223. The title is Advances in the Design, Production, and Construction of Stone Matrix Asphalt. And this is the first international conference on SMA, and it was held in November 2018 in Atlanta, Georgia. Eight papers were presented at this conference. The first one was Performance and Life Cycle Cost Benefits. Then there were a couple papers on laboratory testing, which included some fracture testing and also the effect of flat and elongated particles. So if you recall, there were very specific requirements for the amount of flat and elongated particles. So there was a very nice study that looked at what happened when you went outside of that range of flat and elongated particles. And then there are various field experiences as well. So one field experience had some premature rutting. So what were the takeaways from that occurrence? There was one field experience that looked at the low noise of SMA. There was one field experience in a snowy region. There was a 20 year case study and then finally there was an airport runway example for SMA. And the main question of this conference, the main question that was trying to be asked is, after 25 years of use in the United States, why has SMA stalled? It really hasn't gained as much traction as they would have thought it would. So what were some of the reasons for that? So these papers were intended to, and the discussion associated with these papers was intended to try and ask, answer that question. Now, another phenomenal resource, again, if you Google NCAT report 18-03, the report titled Performance and Lifecycle Cost of SMA will pop up. And this is, again, from the National Center for Asphalt Technology, and it's report 18-03. And there are four components to this report. The first component is a market analysis. So this talks about the mixed design principles of SMAs, the tonnage used, and also the costs associated with the SMA. The performance analysis component talks about how you can relate SMA to pavement condition index, what sort of in individual distresses are we looking at, and then also thinking about SMA in terms of a network level tool or a project level tool. And what sort of things need to be looked at if we're looking at our entire pavement network or if we're just looking at one specific project. So a lot of details with the performance analysis on that. Then they provide a life cycle cost analysis for Maryland, Michigan, and Virginia. So three different case studies of the life cycle cost analysis. And then they also go into some details about various lab and field properties. So they do a very nice literature review. They talk about different structural analysis and structural design techniques using SMA. And then they talk about what can be done in the field when you're looking at the surface of the SMA. The main takeaway from this NCAT report was that SMA is equal to or better than super paved dense graded mixes. So they gave it overall a pretty favorable review. 
The final document put out by the European Asphalt Pavement Association, again, if you Google EAPA SMA 2018, you'll be able to find a PDF document titled Heavy Duty Surfaces, the Argument for SMA. And the primary content of this report goes over the use of SMA. So the surface characteristics and SMA for use for heavy duty pavements specifically. There's a nice review of SMA practices in Europe and some current developments from 2018. They go over both economic and environmental benefits. They have some discussion on mixed designs and construction guidance. And then they review 14 countries SMA practices, which include application discussion, requirements discussion, and performance discussion, all on SMA. So this is a very nice overview of what's happening in Europe with SMA. And the main takeaways from this report is that SMA is safe, it is durable, it is economical, and it is sustainable. So this is the end of the Pavenar for the summary of the Stone Matrix Asphalt SMA, the 2020 edition. We went over the background, the design, the production and construction, and then some recent developments of SMA. So thank you for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed.